We welcome all of you tonight, particularly those who have joined us on live stream. We treasure very highly the uh, fellowship of the saints. Amen. This is the way men know we're Christ's disciples, because we love one another. This will be our 51st lesson in the book of Genesis. We're going to be covering Genesis 30, verses 22 through 43. This is an overview, of course. We're not dealing with the finest possible detail. But the detail I do want to deal with throughout here, throughout this book, is how it is acquainting, acquainting us with God. We're becoming familiar with God, with His ways, and with the ways of His people, with how people that have really encountered God, how it's affected them, how they act. It's fairly consistent all through, all through Scripture. And so we'll be touching upon those things. This is our text now, the 30th chapter, beginning at verse 22 through 43. <clears throat> and God remembered Rachel... And God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And it came to pass, when Rachel had borne Joseph and Jacob, that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away, that I may go unto my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service, which I have done to thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hast before I came, and it is now increased into a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming, and now when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt give, not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from it thence all the speckled and spotted cattle, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire." So shall my righteousness answer for me in the time to come, when it shall come for my hire before thy face, everything that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, thou shalt, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. And he removed that day the he-goats that were ring-streaked and spotted, and all the goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of hazel and chestnut tree and pilled white streaks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. 
And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring streaked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring streaked, that all the brown in the flock of Laban, that he put, and he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not under Laban's cattle. And it came to pass whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. And when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and he had much cattle and made servants and men servants and made and, and camels and asses. Amen. Remember now God superintending all of this thing. It's God that said Jacob would be increased and multiplied. And we are witnessing God working in unconventional ways. This text has caused some people a lot of trouble. But I'll tell you, if you whether there are troublesome texts, if you hone up on your faith in God, it, it resolves a lot of the uh, difficulties. Amen. God is building a nation. That's you don't want to forget this. God's building a nation. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's the third, and from him's going to come the nation of Israel in the form of 12 tribes. When this nation is built, no one is going to be able to say, I did it. That's right. So that's why God's working this way. That's a consistent manner of God's working. That's, he consistently works so nobody else can take the credit. Amen. This is one reason why men distort and rest scripture for their own advantage. It's because that gives them room to make cre take credit. If you just stick with what God said, you can't take credit. Because, see, God has rejected the wisdom of the world. It's foolishness to him, and it had better be foolishness to you. And if it appears wise, then you're going on the wrong road. You got to get off of it because that road is the broad road that leads to destruction. So you got to get off that road. Not think in that manner. God put it this way He did it so no flesh could glory in His presence. Amen. And you certainly see that in this, <laughs> this text where leading no flesh could glory in His presence. When Adam obtained a wife, and when Eve bore another son to take the place of Abel, neither of them could say, I have done it. Uh -huh. It was done in such a manner that they both knew God did it. It was God's decision that accounted for the salvation of Noah and his family surviving the flood. Yeah. It wasn't that Noah saw it was coming and then made due preparation. Yeah. You may think that's what the way it is with you. But you were chosen too. Yes, I know some people don't like to hear this. They don't think God does this. But what are you going to tell Noah? Would you tell Noah this? Would you tell Noah if Noah was standing before you? Would you say God doesn't choose anybody? Well, Noah would rebuke you right now. Yeah, that's right. You say, well, it's different now. God's not different. God's never used people unless he chose them. Yeah. Amen. That ranges from Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Amen. all through Scripture, that's the way it was. Abraham owed his total involvement in the purpose of God to yeah. God. God called him, God called him out, mm -hmm. God delivered him, 
God prospered him. God gave him victory. God enabled him to have Isaac. See, it's all he couldn't glory. Isaac was the result of the promise of God. He wasn't the result of human ingenuity. And although his wife was barren, God enabled her to bear two children, but only one of them was elected by God. Eve had a lot of children. Only one was in the messianic lineage. Now Jacob is prominent in God's purpose because of his enablement and his choice. Jacob have I loved. Yeah. Esau have I hated. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of all this work. Yeah. Joseph is born in this text and Rachel prophesies. God's going to give me another son. That's a woman who's been barren for some years. God's going to give me another son. Not I'm going to have another son. Amen. God's going to give me another son. Yeah, right. All right, let's get into this uh, text. And God remembered Rachel. Now, when the scripture says God remembered, it doesn't mean he ever forgot. In the Word of God, there's a sense in which God never forgets. He said to Israel one time in Isaiah 49, 15, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yes. Yeah, we, got, we read about examples of this all the time. This happens all the time. Yes, but they may forget, yet will not I forget thee. I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands, thy walls are continually before me. So that's the sense in which God does ne never forgets his people. When the expression is God remembered is used, it means he focuses his, his attention on, the, on this person to do something about the situation. He's, he had not concentrated on the person before, but now he does. He con remembered that it's like he concentrated on him. And we have Noah. We have the same example. There was a prophecy when Noah was born, his father prophesied, this same shall comfort us concerning our work. For 480 years, it looked like maybe this is forgotten. But at the end of 480 years, God, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's another way of saying God remembered Amen. Noah. That is, he was ready to use him now, see. When he remembered, and this, at that point, there's a work going to begin at that point. We have the example of Joseph. It may appear as though God forgot Joseph. He was hated by his brethren, thrown into a pit, sold to a band of Midianites, falsely charged by Pharaoh's wife, imprisoned for about 13 years. It looked like he was forgotten, see. Any human analyst would say he'd been forgotten. But the psalmist, he refers to this. He says, uh, until the time that his word came, he was in shackles, they hurt his feet. He was, uh, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. That's what's happening. He's being tested. How are you going to hold up under the mismanagement of someone else? How you? Well, this can get pretty personal. How are you going to react when someone treats you unfairly? What are you going to do? We got laws. What are you going to do? See, just. We got this as the word of God. God was testing him out, trying him, till his word came. And then the king sent and loosed him in a day. This happened in a day. King sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him the lord of his house, ruler over all of his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. What happened? God remembered Joseph. 
See, what I'm pointing I'm making here, when it says God remembered, something's going to happen. Amen. God's going to intervene, do something. We have the example of Moses. Moses was born during a time of oppression. In fact, when he was born, the law of the land was kill all the male children when they're born. Yeah, that's a that was the time he was born. But his parents hid him for three months. <laughs> they didn't have nurseries in those days, you know. They, the parent was able to keep a three-month-old baby from being hurt. Yeah. You had to figure out how this was done, but they did it. Hit him for three months because they saw he was a proper child. I said, this is not an ordinary child. This is, God's going to do something with his child. We're not going to submit to the law of the land. We're going to be disobedient to the king. The next 40 years, it looked like God had forgotten about the whole thing. One day after Moses had been an additional 40 years in the wilderness, God remembered. And he, fo he remembered Moses, focused upon him, and announced to him he's going to use him to deliver Israel. See, I'm showing that when God remembered, something happened. Yeah, amen. Amen. And you, if you're familiar with the Psalms, quite frequently the psalmist would say, remember me. Yeah. Yeah. Quite frequently you'll read that phrase, remember me. Yeah. That just doesn't mean think about me for a while. It means do something about my situation. Yeah, right. Now I wanted to just take a moment here to briefly mention some of God's remembrances. At the conclusion of the flood, the scriptures say, Genesis 8, 1, God remembered Noah. No living thing survived. Then God remembered Noah. Genesis 19, 29, God's going to destroy Sodom. Lots in there. Mm -hmm. Sometime earlier, Abraham had prayed, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Mm -hmm. said, it, it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham Amen. and Amen. sent Lot out. Mm -hmm. How's that? <laughs> Does it seem like your prayers maybe aren't effective for somebody else? Mm -hmm. But when God remembers, yes. Amen. he does something. Our text says God remembered Rachel and hearkened her and opened her room. Next, it is 2.24. The children of Israel are in hard bondage. They're crying unto the Lord. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See? Amen. They did they were going to do something. God told Israel, Leviticus 26.42, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember? I will remember the land. Amalek abused Israel. God told years later through Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. Okay. Maybe you have suffered some uh, injustices that hurt. God remembers it. Amen. He knows. God told Israel he remembered their better times even. He told the prophet, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. The kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember when you were more tender. I, I, I remember. He told Israel, I remember all our wickednesses. These sinners, particularly religious sinners, they think they're getting by. Uh, they scoff. I don't believe in God. I don't follow God. I tried that thing and it doesn't work. Hey, God hears all that. God remembers that. Amen. Uh -huh. God remembers. 
Each of these, again, each of these remembrances were a prelude to some for, form of divine judgment or blessing, one, one or the other. God remembering is what we co would, would call an anthropomorphism. That is, you describe God in human terms, not because he's like men, but he kind of reduces it down to what we understand it a little better. An anthropomorphism, by definition, is an interpretation of what is not human or personal in terms of human or personal characteristics. So you take something that is really ab above your understanding, but you, you bring it down and make, kind of make a parallel so you can grasp it. Amen. So we read in scripture of God, God's face, God's eyes, God's ears, God's mouth, God's hand, God's feet, God's arm. Well, it isn't that he has eyes and feet and arms. It, he's making God more understanding. It's God stooping down so we can kind of understand. Now, the, the psalmist said of God, he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and are on earth. He, it comes down so there can be kind of a communication between God and man. Now, the ultimate example of this, of course, is the Lord Jesus, who humbled himself, made himself of no reputation, and came down so we could understand. Because <laughs> it was not possible to take flesh up that high. You, you had to create something in man that could go that high. See? That's why a person has to be born again. That's why there's no natural aptitude with which you can comprehend God. So God, He comes down. Yes. Talk about God remembering. You know, this can this provokes a great amount of peace yeah, in a amen. believer when you, when no amen. matter what it is, no matter what's going on, if men have forgotten you and are abusing you, if you can just remember that God remembers. It. it I have experienced this. It neutralizes all, it seems like it neutralizes the circumstance. That's right, it does. It does, in our perception, it does. Yes. There's also comfort to be had in remembering what the Lord said he won't remember. Yes. Oh, yeah. Amen. Will I not remember? Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Well, given, you have these instances where God remembered listed and I was just going through my concordance and you listed just about every one that I had in that list Noah, Abraham and the covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob but there was one that you didn't go as far as it's Samson yeah, that's right. his death is found in Judges 16 <coughs> starting in verse 28 and Samson called unto the Lord and said O Lord God remember me Yeah. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I be, may be at once the avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Amen. It's God remembered, so yeah. he, he was entreating God, remember me, so that something right. can't happen. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, this is, this is teaching us how to pray. Yeah, amen. It's teaching you how, how to address difficulty. How do you address difficulty? Some people address difficulty by just griping. <laughs> I'm address difficulty by telling it to somebody else. <clears throat> and we all have our weaknesses in this area. But the ideal is to take it to the Lord Amen. and to ask the Lord to think upon you, to remember you, to look upon the circumstance. I mean, you're, you have access to God. These are some things you can bring before God. Amen. Things that keep you awake at night and they're very troubling and you're not the only person who's had situations like that. And if you say you haven't had them, well, you probably lie about other things too. Yeah. Everyone who's in Christ has these things that are very troubling to them. They're like unique to them. But this is what you do when you have them. Mm -hmm. You call upon the name of the Lord and address them. Amen. Ask God to look on you and listen to you. And it says God remembered Rachel and says he hearkened to her. So she, she'd been saying something to him. That's right. The scriptures don't say that she prayed, but see, she did. Uh -huh. yeah. He hearkened to her. See, there's a sense in which nothing's hidden from the Lord. When the children of Israel murmured, the scripture says, the Lord heard it. <laughs> when certain people objected to Moses being their spokesman, Numbers 12, 2 says, the Lord heard it. 
James wrote of some pretentious Christians who had cheated their workers. And he said, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you is kept back, but which is of you kept back by fraud, didn't, didn't pay them their wages, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have been, you've been cheating the people. God. They cried. Who'd they cry to? The governor? Oh, no. They cried to God. God heard their cries. No one can afford to imagine that they can speak a word, good or bad, that God doesn't hear. And it's a rescue from a lot of, a lot of things. Previously to our text, it says the Lord hearkened to Leah, mm -hmm. and she conceived. Ever since we, we've been introduced to this. Now John, he takes up this matter of God hearing, and he reasons. Here's some sanctified reasoning about it. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is reasoning upon God hearing. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So there's the doctrine fleshed out, see? We said when he hears, he does something. When he sees, he does something. When he remembers, he does something. John builds on it and says, if you can pray within the circumference of God's will, you'll get it. Amen. That's what he said. Say, why are, why are our prayers answered? Do we really have to answer this? It's because they're outside the circumference. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's why. Or it's because the person is wicked. Mm -hmm. That's another reason. But that's a potent, that's a potent doctrine right there. Yes. Yeah. There's not a lot preached about this, uh, let me tell you. There's a lot of might be, maybe, and that sort of thing, but no. If God hears, that means he paid attention to what you said, uh -huh. and you're going to get it. Amen. God hearkened unto her, and he opened her womb. So her barrenness was a kind of a test. And Rachel endured the test. She never reconciled herself to being barren. Amen. Yeah. Kept on bringing this some years now had passed. She didn't say, well, what's, what's the use, you know? God hearkened to her. And that followed the birth of ten other sons by someone who wasn't her, yeah. who had them by her husband. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sister Rosa. See, uh, this hearkening to her it involved her praying we yeah. assume. But it also involved her uh, participating in what would cause her to not be barren. And we can think about this in the, in the spirit, in the spiritual realm of us, if we consider ourselves barren in a way spiritually, but we want to be fruitful, then we can pray, but we got to, we got to enter into that so we can receive the grace to be That's able right. to be fruitful. So That's she right. entered into this as she as she uh, wanted it. She, she did what she could in the match. That's right. Remember, she, she tried the mandrake approach. Yeah. We're going to find she didn't do that. For the next child, she didn't, she didn't call for mandrakes. <laughs> she conceived and bare a son. Here's her response. God has taken away my reproach. Now, she's not the first one that responded. People in Scripture... I'm impressed with how they, this early in history, how they responded to what happened to them. When God gave birth to Isaac, Sarah said, God made me laugh. When Abraham's servant came to the house where he could find a wife for Isaac, he said, The Lord has blessed my master greatly. Abraham's servant referred to the prospective wife of Isaac as the woman whom the Lord hath appointed. Now I'm showing here that they they, the success, they traced it all consistently back to God. Yeah. Testifying concerning his trip to Laban's house, Abraham's servant said, The Lord hath prospered my way. Mm -hmm. When Isaac found a place in Canaan where there wasn't strife, he said, Now the Lord hath made room for us. 
now will be fruitful in the land. When Leah first conceived, she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. When Leah conceived again, she said, The Lord hath heard that I was hated. When Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, conceived, Rachel said, God hath judged me and hath heard my voice. When Leah conceived her fifth son, she said, God hath given me my hire. When Leah bore a sixth son, she said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now that Rachel bears a son, she says, God has taken away my report. See, these, now these were spiritually primitive times. There wasn't any Bible or anything like that. But you see how these people trace everything Amen. back Amen. back to God. It's fairly consistent all through Scripture. Now that's to be the word of exhortation to us, that we don't want to be outdone by people that live prior to the gospel. Though she conceived, she brought forth a son and called his name Joseph. Word Joseph, name Joseph means increase or addition. She knew this was just isn't going to be the end. The clause that follows suggests that Rachel now expects another son. I'm going to have another son. She would have two with both being accepted. That's like a first. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> Cain and Abel, one was accepted, see. Abram had two sons, or well, was it eight sons? First two, Ishmael and Isaac, but only one was accepted. Of all his sons, only one was accepted. Rebecca has two sons, Jacob and Esau, only one's accepted. Now, she's got two sons, and both are accepted. And actually, all the others will be accepted, too. You see what a remarkable <laughs> remarkable thing. God shall add to me another son. She sensed the blessing of the Lord was large. This is just just, 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 just the beginning. Someone uh -huh. said, how did she know that? I don't, I don't know. She's seen enough of God, though, to be able to think like this. See, she's seen enough of God to be able to think like this. God's going to give me another son. And this time, is a business. she's not going to ask for mandrakes this, <laughs> this time. Now, that for, for the child of God, this is a refreshing way to thank another. God's going to give me another. There's going to be more. And there's a lot of this in Scripture, this idea of more, add, add addition and more. From strength to strength, from glory to glory, free from sin in order to be servants of God, dead to the law in order to be married to Christ, the effectual working in the measure of every part in order to the increase of the body. The Lord had redeemed us from all iniquity that he might purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Begotten of God in order to a living hope. See, it's all reflected all through Scripture that once God starts, more is going to follow. And we expect this to extend on out into eternity. So you never top out. One of the deadliest modes of thought that Babylon has created is the now I've got it mentality. Now there's a lot of this, a lot of this being preached and taught. Some people hold forth the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the evidence of speaking in tongues. If you can get that now, you've, you've got it. Some people hold out the victory over a particular sin, finally you gain the victory over it, now you've got it. See? This is a way of Babylonians thinking Amen. now I've got it. Yeah. but you will never really be able to say that mm -hmm. you will see this is just the beginning that's the best you'll be able to say you've got to remember that and it'll dawn on you the blessing of the Lord will accentuate this that I have this treasure in earthen vessel mm -hmm. which means it like yeah, that's right. leaks <laughs> like a bag with holes. It, mm. We were just talking, Brother Jason and I, about having refreshing thoughts and then forgetting them. Mm. Yeah. That's because of the earthen vessel. Yeah. That's what that, 
So you see, just our situation demands that there be more coming because you, you, you just don't keep everything. In a sense, you keep it. You can bring it back. The Holy Spirit can bring it back to you. I understand that. But you can't live in a lively awareness of everything you know at any given time. Ever give us to a point where we don't need him. Yeah. That's right. We need him That's all right. the time. That's right. Yeah, the same grace that we acquired in order to stop doing something is required to maintain. To That's stop. right. Amen. 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 So you'll never be you'll never be delivered into a lap of ease where everything yeah. just is uh -huh. smooth all the time. That's why we have words like better and more. And exceeding. That's why those words are in there. Because this you are you are in on something that's on continued increase and of his kingdom and increase. Yes. Of his increase and kingdom. Yes. There shall be no end. Amen. Well now Jacob's got his wives. He's got eleven of his he's got yeah, eleven of his twelve children. Mm -hmm. So he says to Laban, send me away. Send me away. He'd prospered a lot in the house of Laban, but this isn't where he was intended to be. I mean, yeah. God didn't call him to live with Laban mm -hmm. yeah. or in Laban's country. He was to live in Canaan. Yeah. Let, let me go back now. He didn't reproach Laban by saying, I can't stand it here anymore. Yeah. Uh -huh. you got to see how he said this now. you got to see how he said this. He didn't say, oh, I hate it here. I, I, I just can't stand it here. He says, let me go so I can go to my own country. Yes. Mm. Because we're living in a dying universe and a defiled world and a mortal body, life can deal some hard blows to us. Mm. No one can make those hard blows pleasant or to be viewed as fa favorable. Someone said once that pain is bad and pleasure is good, but pain's not the worst thing and pleasure's not the best thing. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes flesh will cry out, Why did this happen to me? Or I'd rather be dead mm -hmm. than go on like this. Mm -hmm. Or as Solomon said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh -huh. See, that's, that's the response of flesh. That's yeah. a flesh that's right. yeah. response. So you want to, if you've been tempted to respond that way, and I, I don't think any of us could really say we never mm -hmm. responded like that, but he, lay your hand on your mouth. Don't allow yourself to say Amen. it. Let's look at some people who were experiencing difficulty, how they, how they responded to it. Job, extraordinary sufferings. Here's what he said. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's, that's his, that's his response. Praise God. He said, it may get worse, but I'm still going to trust him. Amen. Hannah said, when she experienced bitterness, she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Yeah. David, when the waves of death compassed him, he said, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he did hear my voice. Nehemiah, when Sanballat and Tobiah were bothering him, he said, My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Let me tell you, we can pray this way. Yeah, amen. These Babylonians that are heckling us, yeah. think on them, Lord. Yeah. They're making it a little difficult. Mm -hmm. The early church, when they experienced difficulty, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Mm -hmm. Paul, when he experienced a grievous thorn, said, Most gladly, therefore, I'll rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When he was in bondage and incarcerated, he said, I know that this will turn out to my salvation through your prayer and supply the Spirit of God. 
See, there's been holy people in Scripture, we got the record, and how they responded to painful and uncomfortable crises. How did they respond? This tells the story. That's our prayer that in our fellowship that with this attitude would be cultured yes. of a proper response to God. Amen. Yeah. We're not going to jump on anybody's little right. force, Amen. but if they continue, we might. Because <laughs> it's not right, see. You might remember that Israel was noted for murmuring. And I gave you some text there. They, they were noted for it. Every time things went bad, they murmured. Mm -hmm. And they complained. And they griped. <coughs> God responded, Numbers 14, 27, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. It taxed God's patience. It still does. Yeah. When a person complains and gripes and moans, mm -hmm. this taxes God's patience. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Yeah. don't provoke him. Mm -hmm. During Job's trial, he did not murmur or complain. That's right. In fact, he sought access to God so he could kind of talk this over with God because mm -hmm. he didn't understand what was happening. Here's what he said, Oh, that I knew where I might find him that I might come even to his seat, I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I'd like be like a lawyer. I'd present my case and see what he'd... Yeah. That's how you respond to difficulties. See, yeah. these are examples of how you respond right. uh, to difficulties. Amen. Later when the Lord responded to Job, here's what he said. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? You, you, you're going to tell me, you're going to tell me, Job, a better way for me to act towards you? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered. This is Job answer. Behold, I am vile, and what shall I answer thee? I'll lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. You'll never hear another complaint out of my mouth. That's how he responds. Yes. So if you're tempted to, to murmur, complain, take this as, a, as an example. So Jacob says, give me my wives and my children. It's not an unreasonable request. He worked for them. Yeah, it, was, right. it was an agreement. Yeah. 14 years he worked for Rachel. And had willingly accepted Leah. He reasons with uh, Laban. He'd been a, even though this was unfair, he was a good worker in spite of the fact these were not exactly pleasant circumstances. He said, Thou knowest my service, which I've done to thee. Some versions say, You know how much work I have done for you. You know how very well the service I've given you is. You know how well, how faithy I've served you. So he could point. I was a hard worker. See, I, you know what kind of work I did. Yeah. Even though his tenure or time he spent was attended by rather grievous circumstances, he still it didn't affect his work. Yeah. Uh -huh. and perhaps you've known people that said, "Well, they they've had a lot of trouble and it's affected their work." Mm -hmm. it, it didn't affect Laban. That's right. Uh, it didn't affect Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't yeah. affect his work. Yeah. He, Jake, Laban brought him a lot of disadvantages, but he he says, you know, yeah. how well I've worked. Do you want to be able to say to your employer, now you know, you know how well I've Amen. worked now. You know how yeah. things have been a lot better since I've been here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm serious. You want to yes. be able to work yeah. just like that. Yeah. It's unfortunate in the industrial and retail business world, professing Christians do not have a good reputation. Yeah. It's worse with the church world, even worse. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been in the business world, you know this is the case. Mm -hmm. Someone says, I'm a Christian. You say, ah, I don't know why I said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how they react. I'm telling yeah. you the truth. Uh -huh. Unless they themselves are believers and know what a real believer is, uh -huh. that's how they react. But it should not be so with the people of God. They should be the yes. best workers. Yes. 
even though labor and toil had been imposed upon men because of sin, remember? Work was imposed on men because of sin. So if, if work's hard and you have to work by the sweat of your face, that's what, mm -hmm. that's the penalty for sin. Yes. Amen. Considerable of human, humanity does not do well yeah. in laboring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though it's been imposed mm -hmm. upon them. So it's a work where God can receive glory and a good reputation. Those in Christ should be the very best employees. Yeah. So Jacob is an ancient example of someone who worked in this manner without the benefit of redemption. Yeah. Uh, without the benefit of redemption. So Laban, he, he responds, he says, well, if I found favor in thy eyes, Terry, come on, work a little longer for me. Terry, stay if it pleases you. Laban is pleading for Jacob to hear him out, listen carefully to what he has to say. He's going to present what he feels is a good argument now mm -hmm. to stay and work a little longer. He's already given some record. He gives some recognition that he sees God has blessed him because of Joseph, but he's kind of selfish about this. God's really not in all his thoughts. Now he's going to think of it as a man. He says, I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for thy sake. Mm -hmm. Now again, I do want to share with you what some of the versions, how they read here. Because you know that I'm like a, an opponent of multiple versions. Yeah. And I can prove my case. So I don't want to really challenge me on this. But now here's how this I have learned by experience. Here's how this American Standard, New American Standard, English Revised Standard, National Authorized Version says, I have divined. Hmm. NIV and several other versions say, I have learned by divination. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's how they read now. I'm telling you the truth. Here's basic Bible English. I've learned, I've seen by the, by the signs. I've discovered by a divine sign. Darby says, I discovered. That's a little better. Geneva Bible says, I perceived. That's good. God's Word Bible says, I've learned from the signs. I've observed the signs. I've learned through divination. I've learnt by divination. I have become wealthy. That's a, <laughs> it's a new living by translation. I have observed diligently. That's good. Here's a living Bible. A fortune teller that I consulted told me. That's a quote. Cool, I'm quoting it. I'm quoting this. Here. The Apostolic Bible says, "Before you, before you, could I foretell? I could, I could prophesy this." Septuagint version. Brenton says, "I would augur. Augur means one that was purported to foretell events. Mm -hmm. I could augur that. I could have foretold you this as well." Contemporary English version says, "I'm sure." English Revised Version says, I know. Literal interpretation says, I have seen omens. The Message Bible says, I've learned through divine inquiry. Amplified Bible says, I've learned by experience and from the omens in divination. There's, there's 20 different views of this text. Amazing. Mm -hmm. It can be summarized in these. I'll just summarize them. Some, that he personally used divination or and arrived at a at the stated conclusion. That's one representation. Mm -hmm. That he consulted with some other diviner to reach this conclusion. That the conclusion was reached by observing signs. Mm -hmm. That he reached this conclusion by a special sign. Mm -hmm. That his wealth was the sign that he made a special inquiry into divination, and this is what it should be, that he arrived at the conclusion centered by observing Jacob's circumstances, and he concluded God is with him. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 
All of these people that translated these had access to the original language and all the lexical yeah. aids available yeah. and all the yeah. history that's available. Yeah. So, so that means that lexical aids and original language and other writings, they're not the secret because you yeah. can read them and Amen. come up with these flaky ideas. Yeah. Right. I don't believe there is evidence to represent Laban as having consulted a diviner or used divination. Now this interpretation is based on a Hebrew tradition that's attached to one of the words used here. Right. And that's not the way yeah. to translate the Bible. So whoever did Amen. that, we need to find out who did it and put them out of business. Amen. See, people, I've tried to emphasize this over and over, people have felt too much liberty oh, yes. in handling Scripture. Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, for someone who knows what God has to say about divination, yeah. so Laban had uh, beheld the increase in his own possessions that could not be accounted for by normal considerations, and so he said, God, God did this because of you, Joseph. You, Joseph, you did this because of God. He knew by personal experience that his circumstances were better after Jacob yeah. had been with him than they were before. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now there's a principle to be seen here in salvation. The principle of being blessed because of someone else. Mm -hmm. For example, God has forgiven you for Christ's sake. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. He has accepted us because we have loved his son and believed he came out from God. It is wholly because of our willing identity with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. that we have been accepted by Him. I'm showing you that yeah. there is such a thing as being blessed for the sake of somebody else. Yeah. It isn't because you're so precious in His sight. Mm -hmm. If you're precious, it's only because you're in Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. So we can say, I have learned by experience the Lord has blessed me for Jesus' sake. We can, say, we can say that. Now, the fact that people don't do this is owing to the, the slant of the teaching in our day. The, the teaching of our Christian teaching in our day is slanted in such a way that people will not come to this conclusion. They won't say, well, I've been blessed because of, you know, Jesus or because of one of God's people. They won't reason that way because this is not how the teaching they have been given teach, it leads them to reason or think. And whatever you're taught leads you to think in a certain way. So if you've got crooked thoughts, you've got crooked teaching somewhere. Now experience, it seems to me, is not the easiest or best teacher. As it is until the senses are exercised to discern both good and evil. If your senses haven't been exercised to discern good and evil, you can't really learn very much from experience. Am I right? If a person does not have some understanding of the thing that is learned, mm -hmm. you'll have no way of identi identifying its source or yeah. anything about it. In the case of Laban, he had already made an association between Jacob and the God of Jacob. And he had the concept of increase coming from God, having heard the witness of Abraham's servant some years before. So the very real witness, he what he witnessed matched the words that he'd heard. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So Laban says to Jacob, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. Like you, you, name, you name what you want. Well, that actually is what uh, he's, his first agreement was based on that. Remember? Yeah. Uh -huh. And he, he wasn't too faithful in carrying it out. Laban said, when he first came, Laban said, because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? So that's yeah, the I same know. thing he said back then. Yeah. But now Joseph, he's got a heap of wisdom <laughs> since then. Now this is actually kind of an unusual precedent. You name the wage. I can tell you that it's very rare that in, you will go to any employer and they will say, how much do you want to make? You, you tell, me, tell me what hourly wage you'd like or whatever. 
There are some examples in Scripture, at least two, where Jesus said to somebody, what do you want? One is blind Bartimaeus, you remember that? When Bartimaeus knew Jesus was passing by, he wasn't about to let him pass by. Yeah, Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on me. He kept on crying out. Remember the disciples said, shh. All that noise. We come from a background. We don't like a lot of noise and a lot of talk. We want to keep it toned down. He cried out the more, and then Jesus stopped commanding to be called. And he said to him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Yeah, I've thought about this question. Bartimaeus said, I might receive my sight. Yeah. And he got it. And if, if it just narrowed down to one thing God would give you, yeah. what would it be? What would you add? I mean, this is just good to think about it. You have to, you have to decide for yourself on this, but yeah. kind of whittle, whittle it down to one, yeah. one thing that you think would address everything. On another occasion, now he, Bartimaeus got his request. He might have said, well, I've been begging in this robe for a long time. But could, I, could you get me a new robe? Or he could have said, could you speak to the people that pass by that they throw a little more money in, the, in my container here? But he knew what to ask for, see? Another occasion, the mother of James and John came to Jesus with a request, and he said to her, too, what wilt thou? What, what, what do you want? She said, well, grant that my two sons may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. And Jesus turned it down. He said, well, this isn't mine to give. This, I'm not authorized to do this. And beside that, it's already been assigned. So sometimes you get what you ask for, and sometimes you don't. Yes, right. <laughs> We're learning that Jesus always works within the framework of God's purpose and God's will. Yeah. And the more you know what that purpose is and what that will is, the more focused you can be in your requests Amen. to the Lord. Uh, yes? I just had a couple of thoughts about this. Um, Laban telling Jacob, name your wages. Yeah. And, J and Jacob's response here. Yeah. Um, one one thought is I think I think Jacob he he's being wise here in that I'm not sure he's fully trusting Laban at this point. Oh no. Yeah. And it kind of reminded me of the when Jesus said you should be wise as serpents, serpent, right. innocent as right. seems to all of God's people. One time Jesus told a parable. You know, he said the the people of the world are wiser. Yeah, and the children of the light in their generation, yeah. Yeah, so it seems to me I think all of us could. We probably had times when we weren't very wise. That's right. In dealing with with people. That's right. And the other thing is too, and maybe skipping ahead a little bit, but I think Jacob knew intuitively it was it would be it was wrong for him to allow Laban to let's do everything. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And this this would be like. Going this is, instead of Jacob going to God, which is what he does basically, goes to God for the blessing. Mm -hmm. It would have been wrong for him to go to Laban for the blessing. Yeah. Amen. So it's a it's a mistake. It's a mistake for God's people to seek to be prospered by other sources other than God, whether it's Amen. A, an employer or, yeah. or or even in the, even in the spiritual realm. You, That's right. Seeking to go to a man. To be to be blessed in the ultimate sense, yeah, is absolutely. It's it's actually you could say it's a form of it would be a form of idolatry to do that. Amen. Yeah. And what Abraham said in King Solomon, it said, it's "I'll a, not take anything from you lest you say I made it." That's right. That's right. That's right. He knew that too. Yeah, and this thing about one thing that narrowing it down, Paul. He he had a narrowed down response. He said that I might know him. Yeah. And the power of his yes. resurrection. That was a, a focused request. Mm -hmm. now, now Jesus, he, he taught his disciples about yeah. making requests. <clears throat> he said this in John 14, 13 and 14. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything 
in my name, I will do it. But what does that mean, though? You know? Does that mean like in his name is like a formula? You, you, you tack those words on? Is that what it means? It appears to me that here's what it means. Whoever prays the kind of prayer Jesus would pray in that circumstance. Whoever has his mind and his objectives and prays because of him rather than simply because of himself, that person's prayer will be heard. So in redemption, you're joined to the Lord or God puts you in Christ. There is such a thing as the mind of Christ that you can participate yeah, in. Yeah. And whatever is prayed with that, with that mindset, right. you'll get. Yes, amen. Now once, once you see this, the wrongness of teaching people to be self-centered becomes yeah, yeah. very amen. apparent. thinking that in my name means you're calling his character in, into the, I mean, you, you couldn't ask something for God to do against his character. It, it would be out of line. Yes. But the more you know God, the more you know what he will, what, what he's like and what, what he would be in That's agreement right. with. Amen. Yeah. See, the, the limitation in this is, the, is your knowledge of God. Yeah. That's the limiting yeah. factor, but so far as potential is concerned, it's unlimited. That's right. Amen. Another John stated it another way, the same thing Jesus just said. He said, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So there he, he fleshed that out in a doctrinal statement, what, yes. what Jesus said. So Jacob, he, uh, he tells Laban, he says, uh, Thou knowest how I have served thee, how thy cattle was with me. For it was little, that is your flocks, were little, which thou hast before I came, and it's now increased into a multitude, and the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. Amen. That's some statement. Huh? That's some statement. You want to work so you could actually say that. You probably remember how well the company was doing before I came. Why not? If you're a child of God, you should this potential lies out there for you to reason like this. <clears throat> now, whatever anyone may think of Jacob, it better be a in, within the framework of this inspired declaration. Jacob, if he was a deceiver, like some say, yeah. you can only imagine what he would have said at this point. Yeah. But he just laid the facts of the case. He wasn't deceptive at all. It was not proper that, it was not that Laban's life had caused him to prosper because, say, he took Jacob in because he received Jacob and let him live there for a while that God blessed him because he was so kind no, he, he blessed him for Jacob's because yes, he had a he told Jacob he's going to multiply him and he's going to have a lot so he, this is where he's going to get it mm -hmm. amen. now there have been several men who traced their success to someone other than themselves the blessing of Isaac, for instance, the blessing of Isaac. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, will multiply, will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. <laughs> that was one of the fathers there, Isaac. Potiphar, his master, Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. See, now, we don't have uh, business managers today that are this sharp. Uh -huh. yeah. the, the world has exalted mediocre people to places of leadership. Mm -hmm. Tell you the truth, now they have. Mm -hmm. So they can't see mm -hmm. people that would really be a prophet. So they got the profitable people at the bottom yeah. and the stupid people at the top. I mean, that's just the way the world works a lot. 
If you're in the business world, you've probably seen something like this. Pharaoh, for instance, in the days of Joseph, he saw what Joseph said was true, and he turned the kingdom over to Joseph because uh -huh. he saw God has blessed him. Mephibosheth, you don't want to forget, forget about Mephibosheth, mm -hmm. the son of Jonathan. He was down there in a barren place called Lodabar. David found him down there in Lodabar in a discouraged state. And he said, I'm going to let you sit at my table for your father Jonathan's sake. Because of Jonathan, you can eat, you can sit at the king's table. And Solomon, although he possessed unparalleled wisdom, he, he, he ended up angering God. God was angry with him because he appeared to him twice. And he took the kingdom from him. But here's what he said in 1 Kings 11, 11 and 12. Notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it for David, thy father's sake. How about that? So, so Solomon kept the kingdom up till he died, not because of him, for David's sake. The tribe of Judah, what about the tribe of Judah? The days of the king's iniquity, Judah's iniquity broke out. And it would look like God's going to destroy them. But here's what God said, 2 Kings 8, 19. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake. <laughs> See, I'm showing you here how the blessing Amen. comes from another. Amen. Amen. And then there's the world during a time of great tribulation. Jesus foretold a time of great tribulation. It looked like it's going to end the human race. It's going to end it. He said, but for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, Hath he shortened the days? Amen. See? Yeah. And the saved ones that are in Christ, there, of course, their sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a kingdom manner, this manner of increase. I want to just take a moment here. This is a kingdom manner increase, <laughs> not numerical increase, although that, that is included. Uh -huh. The early church did increase numerically. Mm -hmm. God created all things. He issued the command, multiply and fill the earth. See, that's it. Increase. That's the nature. After the flood, when the earth was had a new beginning, he said to Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. See? Increase. When God called Abraham, he promised, I'll make of thee a great nation. Increase. To the fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he promised multiplication and increase to all of them. Under the law, he based upon obedience to the people, increase was promised. Isaiah said the prophet of Messiah's government and peace would increase. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he must increase. In the work of the Lord, it's written that God giveth the increase. Those in Christ are told that God can increase the fruits of your righteousness. God's purpose for the church includes increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. Paul prayed that people would increase in the knowledge of God. The ministry of the joints and bands in the body of Christ are is to increase with the increase of God. Yeah. Divine economy is in order to pray, and the Lord make you to increase and abound. See? God's people are admonished to increase more and more. So this is a mode. Started way back there, increase. Started with one man. Look how we've increased already in, in Genesis. See, individuals in churches that are unproductive and stagnant and not increasing are out of the will of God. They're out of sync with God. They're contrary to God. With the hand of the Lord is favorably extended to the people, it all there's always increase. Always happens. We're, yes. I was wondering this earlier, but it fits in with this increase point that the people of God um, a lot of times are called to increase in circumstances that are not so favorable right. around them, directly Amen. around them. I was thinking about 
um, Jacob and his family here with Laban. We know there was some sort of friction because later talking to his wife, Jacob says, your father changed my wages these ten times. Yeah. And so there was a, an environment of agitation. We know later on the children of Israel in Egypt, they were in bondage. But that's where they were. the nation was increasing and multiplying. Mm-hmm. And so when, when we are called to increase, we're actually in a type of environment that's against us, the world. We're in a body that yes. is contrary to our nature of increasing in Christ, but that's the way the Lord has, has orchestrated these things so that we were able, we're able to show forth His glory in increasing even though the opposition around us Amen. is mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. It's a it's a blessing to me to see brothers and sisters seeing this that we're talking about. So Jacob, he says, I'm not going to let you, you're not going to name my wages. Um, I should, when am I going to provide for my own house? It seemed to be a reasonable question. He had a sizable family now. What, what was he, when was he going to start providing for them? Years later, you know, the the Lord will say that if a man provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. But that principle is always held, held true. It was actually unjust that Laban should have conducted matters in the way he did, and that for one of his relatives, beside. So as Jacob makes no effort to deceive Laban. So he's not a deceiver, like people have said. In keeping with the principle stated earlier, a man should take care of his house. Solomon said, drink waters out of, out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Stop, stop stealing the neighbor's water and drink some of your own. Well, that's quite a thought to think about. So Jacob's, uh, Laban's treatment of Jacob was entirely out of order. And it's in order that Jacob says, now i got to start thinking about my, my family now. Now you think of the superiority of Christ in this matter of providing for his own. There is such a thing as the household of God, or the house of God, over which Jesus presides. Now I ask you, hasn't Jesus provided for his own? Amen. Very well. He's got a house too. Look how he's provided for his house. Admittedly, you might not think this if you view it some of the people who say they're in the house, but the supplies are provided for the house. Jesus is in no way unjust. If you work hard for Jesus, you'll get a lot from Jesus. If you put out an unusual amount of effort for Jesus, he'll produce an unusual amount of blessings for you. That's the way the kingdom works. Uh, of course, if you are skimpy with Jesus, he'll be skimpy with you. Yes. So it's the way it works. <laughs> well, Laban says, all right, what what will I give you? And uh, Jacob says, you're going to give me nothing. I'm not going to let you name my wage. You did the first time you named my wage. I'm not going to let you name my wage. I'll not agree on a settled wage. Now this is, at this time, I think this was as intuitive as, Jay, as Jason suggested. But he chose to bank on God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's right. Rather than on Laban. As a matter of fact, this is confirmed later on in the next chapter. This is categorically stated. Mm-hmm. some things by experience and Jacob had two. Jacob had two, that's right. <laughs> Do this thing for me. So he outlines, uh, he outlines something. <laughs> he proposes that he goes through Laban's flocks and sequesters all of the unusual animals that might be considered inferior by others. Speckled and spotted cattle, brown sheep and spotted and speckled goats. These were all animals that differed from the norm, but they, these were not marks of superiority. 
it would be considered inferior and Laban would easily agree with this. This would be one way to get rid of these things that are in his flock. <laughs> so you have an act of wisdom here that is accompanied by reliance upon God who's going to turn these otherwise inferior animals to superior. So he chose to operate by this principle. God chooses the foolish things of the world and things that are despised. See, so this is what he did. This, this was like a, a foolish thing to do. Separate all the bad ones and they're, they're to be mine. See, faith reckons on God working. Amen. It banks on God working. They that know thy name, the psalmist says, shall put their trust in thee. I'll do it. And there's a number of uh, expressions of this in, in Scripture. And Jacob says to him, Now, now my, my righteousness will answer to me in a time to come. When the time comes to, to pay my wages, you'll see that I've been totally up, up front and plain with you. I've not tried anything that's deceptive at all. I've been upright. So this agreement, I'm not trying like to get, to sneak in the back door, so to speak. I'll be right up front. He affirms his righteousness or his integrity or trustworthiness. When it comes time for my hire, that's when it comes time for, my, for me to hand the wages over to me. Some versions read that this is going to happen the next day. That's right. The Douay version says, My justice shall answer for me tomorrow. Septuagint verses on the morrow. The Brenton version says, The next day on the morrow. But this isn't what the text means. These versions presented that Jacob went out, separated him, and then the next day Laban come and saw, well, that's the only kind you separated. That's just how these versions present it. But the text affirms that Laban himself did the separation. And the day of reckoning was much later. And here he gives the acid test. Now he gives the acid test. Here, now here's the flock that you're going to give to me. All the ones that aren't don't have, that aren't clear in color, all the spotted ones, all the speculars, ring streak means like striped. Give those to me. And if when the day comes you examine my flock, if you find any animal in my flock that's a solid color, you'll know I stole it. That pretty good test, isn't it? You'll know I see he's banking that none of these animals are going to give birth to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the test of Jacob's integrity was uh, straightforward. Laban said, that, that's good enough for me. I would it be according to thy word. I agree. As far as Laban is concerned, these were the unusual animals of the flocks and probably in the vast minority and he didn't want them anyway, so. Yeah, however, he was thinking without God in the picture. Yeah, yeah he didn't have God in mind. But God is in the picture. Yeah. Yeah. God had promised Jacob, Behold, I am with thee, will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. That's right. And will bring thee again to this land. That's yeah. right. So he's banking on that. That's right. Faith is banking on that. So he removed, Laban did, he removed that day the goat, he goats, all these different animals, and he gave them into the hand of his sons, some people think it was Jacob's sons, but Jacob's sons are probably not old enough at this point, Reuben might have been in his teens, but they were not old enough to be shepherds, it's the Laban's sons, he gave them into the hands of Laban's sons himself. And he delivered to them to keep them. Make, make sure that they, they monitored, his sons monitored this circumstance. Now there's a type to be seen here that among the flocks of men there's also a distinction that enables a separation. 
God's people aren't like everybody else. Amen. Not even in appearance. Appearance meaning what they do and say. They're not like other people. There is a difference between them. In fact, there's a text in Deuteronomy 32, 5 that's very arresting. Israel had mingled with the heathen, and he said they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. Is that, that a good text? Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Now listen, there's, pe there's some people today that say they are Christians that their spot is not God's spot. They're just not the kind of people Jesus produces. I'm sorry. They're not the kind of people the gospel produces. They're not the kind of people the new birth produces. They're corrupt. They're a corrupt generation. They shouldn't be called the church. In Christ, the spot of God's children is that they love one another. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, that ye have love one for another. Well, that's got to be something you can see. That's, they don't, that's not something you read their heart. Uh -huh, yeah. No one knows what's in my heart. Yeah, but everybody knows what you say and do. That's right. yeah. Amen. So if, they, if, the, if the sign is that you love one another, that's got to be in some way that's visible. It right? becomes visible. Yeah. See your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So the early church was separate. And the church is told, be ye separate. That's a command from the throne. Be ye separate. All right, now Laban separates the sheep, his flocks, gives them to his sons, and he, he, he locates them three days' journey away. Yes, brother? Before you get too far off of this point of the spot, <laughs> the mark, the thought of branding cattle. Yeah. When each farmer or ranch has his mark <clears throat> and he puts that mark on all of his cattle so there's no confusion as to which whose is whose. This is like what it is. It's not a visible mark. It's one that God gives us that is not visible to these eyes. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Three days journey. Well, how far is three days journey, I thought. <laughs> Well, they figured a three days journey, if you're like moving flocks, about 15 to 18 miles a day. So that'd be like from here to about 30 miles from Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> be that distance. Yeah. That's a little further. They get Mount, a little further than Mount Vernon, I think. 40, yeah. That's how, that's the distance. This is, yeah. Not with planes and trucks. Yeah. <laughs> See Laban, you see, he's calculating, making sure that this, these inferior, they don't creep back in the flock again. Put them up there. Then we come to this unique strategy that Jacob took, which is an intriguing strategy. He took rods, we'd say branches, of green poplars that were growing, driving, of the hazel chestnut tree and peeled white streaks in them. Now the pill means to strip the bark off so that the white appears. He, he stripped it and I got a kind of a picture that is like the rod was ring streaked is what the Bible called it. But that's what it's talking about. He made these branches and he set these branches by the watering troughs where the flocks came so that the flocks are looking at these and the flocks, when they came, evidently they were in heat, mm -hmm. and they would conceive and generate mm -hmm. while looking at these rods. <laughs> now Moses makes clear in the next chapter that God instructed him to do this. I'll, I'll read the text here and throw it for you. And the flock conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring streaks, speckled and spotted, so none of them had to be, none of them had to be sent back to Laban's flock. <laughs> See? Now confirming this whole incident was under divine direction, the next chapter makes clear this was orchestrated by God. 
we'll, I will deal with this when we get there, but I wanted to, I wanted to read this, Genesis 31, 9 to 13. Something Jacob said to his wives. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father. What was that? God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. It came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring-streaked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. He said, Lift up thine eyes, and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring-streaked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban had done unto thee. I am the God of Bethel. Where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest to be a vow unto me, now rise, get thee from this land, and return to the land of thy kindred. Amen. The whole thing was of God. Yes. And when Jacob had enough flocks to return, and he returned. So see, this matter, this was a matter of, of revelation. Amen. Jacob when they brought forth out, remember he's keeping Laban's flock. When the, these rods are before Laban's flock, yeah. and Jacob is keeping Laban's flock, and now here these speckled and ring streaked and spotted animals are born. So Jacob separated the lambs and set their flocks toward the ring streaked. So he, he merged them over here, sequestered them off to the side. He's managing Laban's flock. Which means he's paying attention to what's going on. Yeah, that's right. See, a hireling would have never noticed. There could have been, you know, 15, 20, 100 of these escaped the attention of a hireling, but no, Jacob saw. He paid attention. He was familiar with this flock that he'd been keeping. He worked for another person, but he wasn't a hireling. Now he's able to fulfill the will of God while in someone else's employee, he's fulfilling the will of God. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not into Laban's flocks. Now, I would to God that the professed church do to do this. Not to stick God's people in and mix them with other people. But they, uh, they don't know it very well. It's always been God's manner to separate and divide. Even from the beginning, he divided the light from the darkness. He divided the waters above and the waters beneath. The nations were divided after the flood. Israel was noted for being a people separated from other nations. Israel was to be separate from uncleanness. Sons of Levi were separated from the rest of the Israelites. Those in Christ are told, be ye separate. And at the end, he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. It's, God's a God of separation. But the marvel of it is that Jacob sensed this way, yeah, yeah, way back there. came to pass, whenever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before their eyes. All right, this, He didn't set these rods before the whole flock. Yeah, yeah, right. Just the stronger ones. Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods, the stronger ones. That's, that's who we want to give birth is the stronger ones. That, that's the ones we want to generate the new birth is the stronger ones. That's the ones we want. See, but the church sends out the babies, don't they? They send out the bait. They send out the weaker ones. <laughs> so we got weaker sheep, stronger ones. You say, well, you trying to say that I'm trying to say that the burden of making disciples falls on the stronger ones. Yeah, this is not the job of the weaker ones. Yeah. You don't do it in your own life, you don't do this. Mm -hmm. Now notice Jacob's eyes on the stronger cattle. How did he know who were the stronger cattle? Well, he's been paying attention to the yeah. Amen. to the flock. He knew which ones were in better shape than the others. But the feeble cattle, well, he put them, he didn't put the rods before them. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't want them to generate any more feeble cattle. 
So like Jesus, he knows the flock. I know my sheep, Jesus says. He knows the stronger ones. He knows the weaker ones. He knows who to give the opportunity of increase to. He knows who to withhold it from. He knows all, all of this. Then the summation statement, the man Jacob increased exceedingly and had much cattle, maid servants, men servants, camels, and asses. Now, as his father Isaac told him, God is going to do this. He said, you're going to increase and be multiplied. God's going to do this. Now, he's, he's done it. He's been here over 20 years. <laughs> and he's, the God's done this. Mm -hmm. Now, it types to be seen here in closing that the work that is to be done in culturing the flock of God is much like that of Jacob. Yeah. It's to get the stronger ones mm -hmm. and separate them, in a sense, from the feebler ones. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't ignore the feebler ones, but the, idea, the feebler ones, have we target them becoming stronger. Because there are some things that can only be ministered to stronger souls. There are. And if everybody's feeble, there's a lot of things that they, they're just simply not qualified to hear because they wouldn't know what to do with it if they heard it. But the stronger you become, the more you're able to hear. And so the servants of God are very interested in making the stronger stronger. They're very interested in having a multiplication of stronger disciples. They're very interested in this. But the institution isn't. It is not interested in this. It is not interested in strong disciples. It's just interested in a lot of people. That's all. And so it'll put up year after year after year after year. It'll put up with people that are spiritual infants that aren't trying very hard and just learn to live with them. Well, a good shepherd doesn't learn to live with them. And here's how it works. As the stronger become stronger and stronger and stronger, the feeble ones who have the potential of becoming stronger will be attracted yeah, that's right. to those people, and they'll become stronger, and the ones that aren't serious will want to leave. Yeah. Uh -huh. that's right. Yes, how it works. So we don't have to, like, throw people out. Yeah, that's right. I suppose it could come mm -hmm. to that in some cases, but... Normally how it works is as the things of God become richer and deeper and fuller, those that are disinterested gradually kind of begin to Amen. pass away. <laughs> That's some lessons to be learned from this uh, rather intriguing text. And I trust that you saw how the conscious all the people were about God, the Lord has done this, the Lord has blessed me, the Lord has given this. They, they trace it to his right source. When faced with what looked like an impossible situation, Jacob, with the thinking of faith, thought through the situation and thought of a way to have an advantage without being a cheat yeah, yeah. or lying or stealing. He thought of a way to gain the advantage that would give glory to God. Mm -hmm. And he, he set up a situation where he had to trust in God to do it. It was a situation yeah. over which... He had no control. I think he knew that these rods just of themselves wouldn't do this, although some people have examined it and said the sheep do have a tendency to do this, but he'd set up a situation where God had to do the, do the work, and then he trusted in him and kept an eye on the flock and yes. had an appropriate reaction when Amen. to the birth of a new flock. Yes. Any of you have a closing word or something you'd like to add? Brother Jeremy. One of the things I was thinking about is noticing that <clears throat> you notice that whenever God uses someone, it's not because they were just sitting around doing nothing. This whole time he is working. That's he, right. he was he he's working for Laban. He, he's just just doing what he's supposed to be doing. Opportunity arose. The Lord gave him wisdom to take it. I don't want to say take advantage of it, but he he was he was ready to to do this. Amen. And see, a slothful man wouldn't even thought of it. Sloth man wouldn't even want to take a, take him and, and and go start to go be on his own. He'd, he'd just be content to be under Laban. Just but see, a man of God is like this. They they're working until the Lord calls them to do something, and they're ready to That's do right. it. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Some people can have they have preconceived notions about Jacob. They've heard that he's yes. a deceiver. 
and they, they've taken Esau's word for it. And so when they get to this part of Scripture, I actually have heard people say that he used this as an opportunity to get the advantage over Laban. But they totally discount what, what you brought up about God giving him this Amen. in a dream. Yeah. God told him what to do, That's right. and he does it. And then they say, well, see, he was, he was just trying to take advantage of Laban. That yeah, dream was something, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, he already, uh, Jacob already knew that Laban was kind of a crook. <laughs> That's uh, right. uh, the only reason he hung around the first time was because he he really wanted to get the, the, the wife of his choice. That's, That's right. right. Amen. That's why he agreed to stay. Mm-hmm. But you know, really, there's a sense. I think maybe Jacob picked up on it, that everything Laban had really was his. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, really, it, 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 technically it wasn't, but it really belonged to him. He was responsible. Because of him, that's right. He, he right. was responsible for all that. I think he, he's before he got the dream. Mm-hmm. I think he sensed that if I'm going to leave, mm-hmm. if I'm going to leave with something, I better, I better stay here. Yeah. Uh, I think he sensed that uh, uh, he was going to come in. That, that, uh, Laban had a lot, right. and he was going to get some of it somehow. Right. I think his faith I do spoke too. to him about yeah. this. I think and then that the dream was, came. And, that was God's response yeah. to this right. it, this intu- intuition that he had as well as an obligation. Mm-hmm. He knew it wouldn't be well to go back home with, with nothing but a family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes? I hadn't realized before um, in this account, I hadn't thought about that some of, the, some of them could have been already pregnant <clears throat> with a... With one that wasn't spotted, but he he he, he went out on faith that none mm-hmm. would uh, have a calf that would be you know pl- you know just white. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's good. You know he had to act in faith, just like all the other ones that that's he right. out, He had to act Amen. in faith, mm-hmm. believing God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah, I've always been intrigued by that whole thing with the rod. Yeah. Amen. And uh, it's kind of like. Uh, Kind of like Jesus spitting on the ground. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. This, you, can't, yeah. you can't reduce spiritual life to like a magic formula. Yeah. That's right. You, but yet that's that's exclusively what the church world does. Yeah. Most of the books that are published are somebody's formula. Here, try this. Yeah. If that were true, though, if you could just say, you know, take these three steps or something like that. It wouldn't require faith or involvement with God. That's, That's it. the point. Yeah. That's it, might it. Seemed, it might have seemed foolish for J- for Jacob to set up these, you know, strip these wooden things, <laughs> set them up like like Naaman dipping seven times. Yeah. In the Jordan. <laughs> yeah. See, it seems like a, a silly thing to do, uh, and I think that's intentional. Amen. By God, so that yeah. so that these things can't be like. This is not magic. That's uh-huh. the, that's not of the Lord. See the Amen. Magic formula. Abracadabra. Uh-huh. Say the ma- That's pagan. That's right. Obedience. See. Uh-huh. He he says you you do this. Jacob did it in faith. He obeyed. Yeah. yeah. Didn't argue with the Lord or that's say right. weird or anything like that. He did it, and, and the Lord blessed him for Amen. it. He kind of like throwing a fleece out. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we Paul. It's also this. This point of picking out the stronger cattle is not just that. Yeah, it's kind of bigger than that as well. I mean, he, he's going on a long journey back home. Mm-hmm. He says, Laban, I'll take, I'll take the weaker cattle for you. So I'll have something for my family. Well, when he gets back home, what's the chance he's going to have any cattle? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and good. that's how the life of the believer is. I mean, it slowed him down. Right. You, you, <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Uh-huh. Amen. Yeah, moving Amen. along a herd of wheat cattle. That, yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, the same people that want to say that Jacob did this with the rods out of some kind of superstition are also baffled that it would actually work. Yeah. Yes. So anybody who takes that stance, though, ends up kind of undermining Scripture yeah. as if to say that, no, somehow it was tainted somehow, make it look like it really worked, we mm-hmm. know this wouldn't really work. But faith, this is like an act of faith. On, That's right. On this, yeah. Amen. On this part, in the sense that he's saying, I'm, I'm trusting God that these mm-hmm. are going to turn out <coughs> striped just like this is. Amen. Like a, like a promise set forth in faith. Uh-huh. Amen. That's visible, like you're saying. It's a visible mm-hmm. uh, expression that I believe God is going to do this. Amen. Amen. This was really like casting a lot. Mm-hmm. That's really what it was. He cast, he cast a lot. That's right. It wasn't in the control of the person. 
Yeah. That's right. Amen. It's completely out of your control. The whole disposing thereof. And that's yeah. what it was. It's, mm -hmm. Scripture says the Lord maketh rich. And that, here's here's an example of the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, I was um, considering when you were reading the different interpretations of that one, one Scripture, how they were so differing and they were so um, offensive. They were just mm -hmm. offensive in, in how men have taken that. The reason why this is is because men have they don't have a fear of God himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't they don't fear him because if they feared the Lord then they would be very careful in how they represented his yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's right. And it shows that there's been a shift from God centeredness to man centeredness. Yeah, that's right. These these so called translations have come about so that people can understand them better. Mm -hmm. This is this is what they promote. Mm -hmm. And this is not, this is not true. Yeah. It's a lie. And it's, it's because there's no fear of God. Amen. Just Annie? Um, there's a couple things I was considering. At the end of your message when you were talking about how those, those who are willingly remain feeble will eventually be repulsive by any assembly devoted to the due preparation of the flock of God. Um, I was considering with the, those who are feeble... Even in the world, when you watch documentaries on these animals, like especially lions, they go for the feeble in the herd. Yes. That's yeah. what their aim is. Because yes, they know right. Amen. They're an easier target. So those who are feeble, they can't be sent out to do the work that those who are stronger can because they'll just immediately be aimed at and taken down. That's and good. And something else is when you're talking about the speckled and the spotted sheep. Um, Sister June had said in her class last week, is that redemption leaves a mark on you. Yeah. That's the first thing I thought of when I was considering this, how the children of God, they have these speckles. They're like marks of, the mark of redemption. Mm -hmm. But those of the world, they don't have this. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 I was considering how Laban thought that this was going to be an advantage to him, but a disadvantage oh. to Jacob by oh. having him take these mm -hmm. defiled or mm -hmm. diminished sort of sheep, but how... The Lord turned it around to Laban's disadvantage. Yeah. But then how, considering also how Satan thought it was an advantage to have Christ crucified because then he would win, uh -huh. and how the Lord turned that to his advantage, disadvantage as well. Yeah. That's right. Amen. 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 Yeah, it's, it's like just what she said. It's obvious that in the past, the, the, the speckled were in the minority. Yeah. I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> and, and, and yet, it, he's, God's going to take... Something that it, it defies logic. That's right. And because, yeah. because um, Jacob trusted him, he's going to turn the tables on Laban. Yeah, that's going to be good. Not just going to be spotted as a speckle, it's going to be strong yeah, spotted as a speckle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this account. We thank you for the report of Jacob and of his trust in you. We pray, Father, that we would have the same spirit and have this, uh, this strong faith to rely on you and to make our plans and purposes within the confines of your will and by faith to be expectant to see great things. In Jesus' name, amen.